All right, we're doing part two. Today we're talking about membranes and transport. All right, so before, those forks aren't mine. Please don't use those. They're not mine. There's someone else brought them for theirs. All that food in there is not mine. Okay. Um, so what we have here is, we're talking about membranes. Ooh. What the? What the? Why did it erase itself? Oh, there we go. All right. Okay. So, hey, you guys got to cut the talking. Okay. So, cell membranes, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to draw it out uh, and the zones and everything. So, you've got, it's the same drawing you've seen several times. So, you've got these things right here. Do you remember what these things are called? They're phospholipids. All right. So, one of these specific things is a phospholipid. All right, and this phospholipid is one of the main components. The other main component that we have within here is proteins, okay? So, woo. those proteins, there are several different types we can have. We can have glycoproteins, which are gonna help in cell communication and cell recognition. We can have channel proteins, we can have carrier proteins that are gonna help move stuff across the membrane, and we're gonna talk about those later, okay? Um, I can also, so I've got more phospholipids within this thing. And then I've got, what I can have is these little guys right here, which is going to look like this. Okay, right here. And this little thing right here is going to help maintain membrane fluid fluidity. Do you remember what that is? Called cholesterol. All right, how cholesterol travels throughout the body. Um, where do you usually hear about your cholesterol being at? Your heart. All right, what's your heart pump? Blood. So I've got to pump this cholesterol throughout my body to my blood, and then it's got to get into my cells. Let's say I've got this. Let's say here's my cells, just for the sake of this, since we talked about it yesterday, it's going to kind of relate to it. Let's say here's my vein, and within my vein, I've got, all right, I've got my little red blood cells traveling through here, and I've also got cholesterol in here. Um, so let's say here's my cholesterol right here. These things are my cholesterol. I need to bring these cholesterol molecules into this. This is a very large bulky molecule that I need to move against the concentration gradient. Any guess on how I get these into those blood cells? It's a very large bulky molecule that I need to move against the concentration gradient. These things have to undergo endos or, uh, endocytosis. So it's going to use endocytosis to bring this cholesterol into the blood cells so that way it can incorporate it into its membrane system. So that's how this gets cholesterol in its membrane system. It's got to pull it from the blood through endocytosis. Okay, That was just a side tangent to kind of connect these two things. Because um, a lot of people are like, well, isn't cholesterol found in our blood? Doesn't it clog your arteries? Isn't it a bad thing? Yes, but it, that's how it's transported to all these cells that we need. Okay, So this cell membrane, part-wise... Um, it's made of this phospholipid bilayer. And within that phospholipid bilayer, I've got these areas. This lipid tails that we have, um, they're what's called hydro. Uh, these parts right here hate water, so they're phobic. And this one right here loves water because it's a polar head, so it's hydrophilic. Okay. <laughs> Because it's got this thing, this area that's hydrophobic, and it's got this area that's hydrophilic, it's only going to let certain things through, all right? And because this cell membrane only lets certain things through, do you know what that term is called? It's called semi-permeable. It's called the permeability of it, but it's semi-permeable, all right? Um, uh, permeable, all right? Meaning only certain things go through. All right, um, any guess what can go through very easily? Water. No. Simon. Oxygen, <laughs> carbon dioxide. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, small nonpolar molecules. Okay. 
doesn't want to emit those in quickly. Okay, so small nonpolar molecules can easily go through this thing. All right, which leads me into my next thing. I'm going to start talking about passive transport. So right now it seems like I'm kind of jumping all over the place. If you've had class already and you saw the words that we worked with, that's why for those of you in sixth period, there's a stack of words on there. You kind of, you're, we're doing an activity today where you've got to relate all these words together. And so I'm doing this in the order of how I would relate them. Okay. So these cell membranes are semi-permeable, meaning only certain things can go through that are small and nonpolar. All right. And so if it's small and nonpolar, it can easily just go straight through that cell membrane. It can go from high concentration to low concentration straight through the cell membrane. Do you know what that's called? Moving solute or moving particles from high concentration to low concentration? Just on its own. That's all it needs. It can just easily go straight through it from high to low. It's just straight diffusion. All right. So we've got movement. All right. So diffusion, which is going to be. Uh, through I'm just gonna put through the CM for cell membrane, so I don't have to write that whole thing out. So molecules move from high to low through that cell membrane. Um, this is called diffusion. Sorry, I should have titled it diffusion. Okay, and the type that do it are small and nonpolar. Mm -hmm. um, diffusion, does it require energy? No. 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 All right. So no energy, meaning what type of transport is it? Ooh, bueno niños. So it's passive. Meaning it's going from high to low. So I'm going to put like the ball, going from high concentration to low concentration. It is going down the concentration gradient. Ooh. But what happens if I want to move across these large or charged molecules such as water? No, boo boo, we're still going high to low. Wait, what'd you say? I still want to go from high to low. I appreciate that enthusiasm. Yeah, I, st <laughs> I still want to go from high to low, but how do I get those charged or large molecules through? The large molecules need love too. Okay. I need proteins to do it. And so what that process is called, it's called facilitated ooh, diffusion. All right. And so facilitated diffusion, it's going to use, uh, uses carrier or channel proteins. Proteins. To let large or polar molecules through. Um, so it lets these large, it lets these polar molecules through. An example of one of them was someone said water. Water can diffuse through the cell membrane on its own, but it does it very slowly. Sometimes we need to do it much, much faster. And so why can't water diffuse through easily very quickly on its own? What trait about water says like, no, boo, boo it's polar. And so we get help from a protein. One of these proteins is specific and it lets it through. Um, that protein is called an aquaporin. So aquaporins let water through faster. What's aquaporin? Aquaforin? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The Kelowna wears aqua de Gio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pull her through faster. I don't know what the thing is. Probably. <laughs> There's a lot of thingies. Okay, so facilitated diffusion, it's these channel proteins or these carrier proteins that have this, it's almost like a tunnel that says, hey, you can come through. It's actually this big tunnel that's got this polar charge and it lets stuff go through it. 
all right, versus this big nonpolar charge like the lipid tails are. Because if it had a big, like, nonpolar charge throughout this tunnel, it wouldn't let it go through. So, hmm? it's just water that goes through. for the aquaporin, it's just water. There's different proteins for specific molecules. Mm -hmm. Some are just general. The aquaporin specifically is good. It's used for transporting water. If I didn't have that aquaporin, water would still go through, but it would just go through very, very slowly. Okay? Then I can get, so facilitated diffusion, it's still going from high to low. Uh, it still does this. So this is still passive transport. All right, meaning it's still going no energy. Meaning it is still going down the concentration gradient of the ball going down the hill. All right, is that all three? Have we done all of our types of passive transport? Or are we missing one? We've talked about diffusion. We've talked about facilitated diffusion. Is that all? Osmosis. Woo. Okay. There are three types of passive transport. There are three types of active transport. It does. All right. Osmosis. For what? Uh, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Because that's why that. So, Simon asked a very good question of why does water still move through slowly? Um, it's because water is very, 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 very tiny. Yes, there are. It's hydrophobic on the inside, and that's what's trying to prevent the water from moving through. But because water is so tiny, it can very, very slowly meander its way through, um, just due to purely due to its size. But if water were a bigger molecule that were polar, it would say absolutely not. That's why sugars can't just go straight through the membrane because they're large polar molecules. Good question, Simon. Okay, it's that big hydrophobic region in the middle of the cell membrane that regulates what can go through. and That's what makes it semi-permeable. All right, osmosis, it's the passive transport of water. Uh, so the passive transport of water from high free water to low free water. From high free water to low free water. Okay. Once you start understanding osmosis, it'll start to make sense on real world stuff. So for instance, I had a brand new tree that I were still in pots the other day. And it was very, very windy. And I did not water the trees. I should have. It was very, very windy. And what that did is the stomata on the leaves opened up and it absorbed all that water in the leaves. So all the extra water that was in the, um, the dirt, it sucked that up to the leaves. But there was no water in the, uh, in the dirt because I hadn't watered it all. So in a matter of 24 hours, almost every single leaf on that tree died. Because there was no water for it because it all absorbed up and it was trying to pull that free water, but there was no free water to pull. And so almost every single one of those leaves died. The tree is fine because it still had water in the tree, um, but the leaves died. So in a matter of 24 hours, every single leaf went crunchy. Okay, um, That's osmosis. So I even tried, I was like, I didn't even know what to do. So I took it and I put the, my hose on like mist feature and tried to mist the leaves and see what happened. No luck. Leaves are dead. All right. <laughs> yes. So osmosis, it's the movement of high free water to low free water. So if we're looking at which way it's going to go, I'm going to use some terms here. So we've got these terms, hypertonic. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> hypertonic means high solute. Low free water. Hypotonic equals low solute, ooh, high free water. So when you're looking at these, the biggest problems that people make is they see hypo and they think low. They're like, oh, that's low water. But no, it's low solute, all right? And so if you don't have that much stuff in there, I always think of it in terms of Kool-Aid. 
This is means like hypertonic, a lot of Kool-Aid, hypotonic, not that much Kool-Aid. All right, hypotonic is really, really watery because if you barely pour any sugar in there, it's really, really watery Kool-Aid because you have a lot of free water because it's not bound to the Kool-Aid. Hypertonic, I have a lot of sugar in there that's really, really sweet. Isotonic, um, same solute, same water. Okay, so water's always going to move from hypotonic to hypertonic. Can you say that again? Water always moves from hypotonic to hypertonic because it's always moving from high free water to low free water, and hypotonic has a lot more free water. Okay, water always moves from hypotonic to hypertonic, meaning high free water to low free water. I'm not going to make, and so I would recommend going back and if you're confused on this, looking at the, the pictures of it where we had, so for instance, if we had something like this and we had 0.2 molar and we had 0.6 molar, which way would free water move? Um, the inside is a lot more hypotonic because there's less stuff in there, so free water would move out. I'd recommend going back and watching that video or looking at that if you need it. Today during lunch, I'm going to put all the videos together, so I'm requesting please don't talk to me at lunch, otherwise you'll distract me because I have the attention span of a fly. Um, please don't talk to me so I can put together the uh, file with all that on there. Okay? Um, shut up. Okay. <laughs> yes. So molarity is talking about how much stuff is in there. How much stuff is another term for tonicity. So the higher the molarity, the higher the tonicity. So if it's got a higher molar, it's hypertonic. If it's lower molar, it's hypotonic. Does that make sense right there? She asked the relationship between like hypertonic, hypotonic, and molarity. Tonic is talking about how much solute do you have. Molarity is also talking about how much solute you have. So if it's got a higher molarity, it is basically hypertonic. High molarity is what would be like hypermolar, all right? Um, hypotonic, lower molarity because you have less stuff or less molarity. Tonicity and molarity mean the same thing. They're, son they're synonymous. So if it one molar is hypertonic to 0.2 molar. All right, less stuff in both of those. Okay, that makes sense? Hopefully. If not, just humor me and say it does. Thank you. Um, there's a video on water potential. So this is all osmosis. You will have a problem on your test that has to do with the calculations for water potential. All right, where you have to calculate out water potential. There's a video on that one. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time going over that, okay? So I recommend watching that one for the calculated water potential. You can either watch the one that I did in class that has a lot of the examples. Huh? Yes, it was the notes from Tuesday. That was the one that had the formula of this equals pressure oh, potential. Pot yeah, I don't know how to get more clear with that. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Or solute potential. I said water potential. I know. Or, okay, so it's this one right here. If you're confused on that, all right, I'd recommend watching the video. And then, remember, it's almost always pressure potential is given to you, or it's going to say it's in an open beaker where pressure potential equals zero. Solute potential, you may have to calculate that out. That's the one with the formula of solute potential equals negative I C R T. Biggest, uh, I'm just going over misconceptions right here. The biggest misconception we have for this right here is I. Uh, so for negative I, if it's sugar, um, it equals one. If it's NaCl, negative I equals two. You have a formula chart that tells you it about sugar, but it does not tell you it about NaCl on there. All right, because salt ionizes into two things or it breaks apart into two things. So if I give you one for sugar, it's one. It tells you that on the formula chart. If I give you one for NaCl, it is two. 
Simonella? Um, so you know how those like, negative ions are distributed to a force that would the negative still affect it then? Yes. So another thing, remember, we said solute potential is always a negative number. Pressure potential is always a positive number or zero. Um, if you ever get a positive number for solute potential, that means you forgot to make negative I because that's where the negative symbol comes from right there. All right, it's always going to be a negative number because it always means you've lost the, the free energy from water because you have stuff bound into it. What is R symbol again? R is going to be the pressure constant. It's always, always, always going to be 0 0.0831. It's also on your formula chart. C is molarity. It's on your formula chart. It's the one like 0.2 molar, 0.4 molar, 0.6 molar. T is temperature. It's also on your formula sheet. And that's going to tell you that it's Celsius plus 273 to get to Kelvin. Is this like going to be on my formula yes. All of this formula is on your formula chart. Wait, what is R? I don't Wait. think I have. Uh, you'll get it when you get your test. Oh. Okay. Oh. So, so the meaning of C and the meaning of R? Yes. Your formula sheet tells you what do all of these things mean. It gives you this formula. And it also gives you this formula. And it tells you what does I mean? It tells you I is the ionization constant. Ionization constant for sucrose is 1. That's all it tells you for that. It tells you C is the molarity concentration. It tells you R is the pressure constant of 0 0.083 molar something bars, whatever. And T is temperature in Kelvin, meaning you have to do Celsius plus 273. It tells you all of that on the formula sheet. But it tells us that that one's pressure and that one's Yes. It also tells you psi p is pressure uh, pressure potential, and it tells you psi s is solute potential. Okay? Last one we've got to talk about. We talked about all three types of passive transport. Now what we got to talk about? All right, active transport. Active transport requires ATP. All right, requires ATP and it's going from low to high. Okay, low to high concentration or it's going against the concentration gradient, okay? Um, there's three types that we have in here. Type number one, Wendy, I need your notebook. Oh, I, oh right here, sorry. I thought you were gonna take it on accident. All right, pumps. It's literally a protein pumping stuff across the membrane. What? Okay. Um, two is going to be endocytosis. Wait, that's it for pump? I don't, yeah, it's just it's a protein that's going to pump stuff against the concentration gradient. It's going to pump stuff from low to high. Um, requires ATP if you, if you wanted to add that. Yep. That's going to be. You don't have to know specifically what that's for. That's going to be used for muscle contractions um, and sending nerve. It's a pump. So yeah. So he's asking about on the video. It talks about a sodium potassium pump. They actually removed. Uh, all of the body systems from the AP bio curriculum, so you don't have to know that one specifically. Um, like the nervous system, the muscle system, all that stuff, none of that's in the AP bio curriculum. I'm sorry, Mimi, you look really devastated right now. Uh, and so that right there is a pump. At one point, you're having to pump stuff against the concentration gradient. So you have all the sodium on the outside, you've got some on the inside, and you've got to pump it back out. Okay? Um, endocytosis, bulk transport in. Requires ATP. Okay. And then finally, we've got exocytosis. That says bulk, right? Yep, that says bulk. Not just buck. Requires ATP. Okay. Um, one of the things you've got to do today, in six, if you're in sixth period, you've got to make a flow chart of all these vocab words. And 
part of it, like if most people just try to group it into two big words, they try to group it into all the organelle and all the membrane transport stuff. One of the biggest ones that they that we tie in and one of the best ways to connect it is one of the organelle is very, very, very easy to tie in with this. Which organelle would be very easy to tie in with this? The mitochondria. Why would you say that? Meaning what? It requires energy. The mitochondria is where ATP oh. is produced. All that ATP is used to drive processes that require energy in the body, such as active transport. Okay? So that's a big connection for when you're doing that flow chart right there. All right. You have three more minutes. Any questions that you guys might have? So we're just going to get tested on like the, uh, basically like all the cells. And you, fair game is everything from – so you've got prokaryotes to eukaryotes. All the organelles that are within there that we talked about. Uh, you've got endomembrane system. You've got the functions of the cell membrane. What is it used for? You've got the transport within there, stuff like that. You need to be familiar with doing the math behind osmosis, so water potential. That's your only math that you have, okay? Like I said, I'll post... Huh? You can use a calculator, yes. You can use a stats calculator, yes. Okay. All right. I'll post the videos at lunch. Please don't bug me at lunch. It's not that I don't like you. It's just that I get very easily distracted. And I have stuff too. Yes, ma'am. It's the main topics. Type it. I can, what I can do is I can give you from my book that tells you, you need it. Students need to know this topic. They need to know this topic. They need to do this topic. All right, so I have something what I can give you, this purple book. Hey, this purple book right here is what all your uh, AP teachers have that says, here's what you need to teach the kids. I can give you all the pages for this unit that says, here's what students need to know how to do or be able to understand or concepts they need to know within this. I'll send you the pages from this. I'll send you the document, but it'll have the pages for it. It's like pages 48 to 62 for this unit. Okay. That was a. Uh, I didn't really necessarily go over it. It's just all the uh, organelle inside that have membrane-bound organelle. Basically, it's everything minus a ribosome, because ribosomes aren't made of membranes. All right. Yes, but don't just memorize those facts. You need to understand the concepts. Yes. So, 